next guest, uh, Dr. Stephen A. Uh, Goldman, adjunct professor at Shepherd University and a uh, doctor of psychiatry. He is an uh, author as well and has uh, put out some books about the Civil War and soldiers and the after effects. Uh, he's done a lot of studying on the after effects of uh, uh, traumatic post-traumatic stress syndrome too. And he's a pretty good dinner guest as well if you ever go out to dinner with him. Uh, Stephen, good morning to you. How are you? That's quite an intro. I'm good. I, I had a little while to work on it, so <laughs> I had some time to to break it out there too. In a on a serious note, it is uh, September the 11th, and I know that you've been invited to speak this evening in regards not necessarily to 9/11 specifically, uh, but uh, some other things that have involved sacrifice over the years. Can you elaborate, sir? Yeah, um, I'm honored to be doing a program, and a la the great job that you folks always do, um, actually decided to do an interview rather than doing a straightforward presentation. And um, I'm going to be tying in a couple of things. I, I certainly will be mentioning 9-11. And, but I'm talking about something I delved into um, in fair amount of depth in, in One More Water Fight, and that's about the concept of commemoration. And um, after the Civil War, it was a raging controversy as to how to commemorate the Union and Confederate dead. And um, actually, it's a, it's a controversy that hasn't gone away um, in many ways, and like statues and other things. And I also tie it into what remains the bloodiest day in American history, which is actually not 9-11. It's the anniversary coming up next week on the 17th, which is the Battle of Antietam. Um, which remains the single bloodiest day in American history. This is uh, a battlefield that I pass frequently on my drive home. It's not all that far from this area, of course. But right. I wonder, we talk so much about Gettysburg. I wonder how many people have actually toured the Antietam battlefield, which you can do with, uh, with, with help from the, the, the park rangers who are there or a self-guided tour. I remember when I did it a few years ago, you could actually buy a CD yeah. Put it in your car CD player if you still have one of those in there, and it guides you through all the stops we did it uh, with the family, uh, I don't know, five, six yeah. years ago. And Stephen can talk to this better than I can, but the difference between Gettysburg and Antietam is that the commercial uh, has not invaded Antietam. Not at uh, all. They have bought the land. The land is pristine. There's a lot of things you cannot do on Antietam. For example, you cannot do a reenactment, which is frequently done in other battlefields. Uh, Antietam used to have something with a on the uh, on the anniversary a uh, a dust walking tour. Uh, they stopped doing it now. Unfortunately, it was so moving, absolutely so moving. By the time you finished, uh, you were weak need. So Antietam is a unique, unique battlefield. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with Bill um, because it's also the tie-in that Antietam now, thankfully, is emphasized at the visitor center, is the tie-in to the Emancipation Proclamation and the meaning of the bloodiest day in American history is what was one of the results of that. And again, Bill, you're right. It's, you know, it's interesting about the battlefields. And we, of course, have, you know, we're so lucky here in terms of uh, between Maryland and Virginia and even, even D.C., You've got Gettysburg, you've got Antietam, you've got Monocacy. And the battlefields are all different. And the experiences are very different. And, uh, Bill, wouldn't you agree at Antietam, there's a different feel, for example, being in front of Dunker Church or um, uh, the Sunken Road, actually Bloody Road, and... The fact there was a one, essentially a one-day battle as opposed to the three-day battle at Gettysburg, which is similar with Monocacy being a one-day battle, even though they were part of campaigns. Um, I couldn't agree with you more about coming out to the battlefields and the park service with my work. They're wonderful. I mean, the, the park rangers, the historians there do such a great job of presenting not just what happened militarily, but the impact of what happened militarily and um, so certainly what resulted from 
these battles is easily as important yeah. as the military aspects. Yeah, I agree with you very much about the atmosphere, the ambience around uh, uh, Antietam. There's this, another battlefield. In fact, I think there's Antietam, as you said, it was the bloodiest one-day battle. Uh, Shiloh was the bloodiest battle, and then the particular engagement, there was one uh, at uh, in Gettysburg. But Shiloh has the same ambience, same uh, feeling that you were actually on the day of the battle that Antietam does. So, gems to visit if you have the chance. Well, I tell you, that's, again, that's a great point. Uh, the first time we went out to Shiloh, we started literally at the house that Grant was staying in when um, they heard the cannons. And what ties in beautifully is that um, Alex Haley's family uh, I believe it was his grandfather, you know, the, the, the author of Roots, uh, owned the ferry in the very area that Grant, uh, where Grant was staying, was on. So again, the tie-in you have, and again with Shiloh, it was so early in the war, um, there's a great book about Shiloh, which makes the point, it was like two mobs fighting each other, because the war, they they were not as experienced at that point. And of course, Day one at Shiloh was a, a disaster for the Union, where they barely hung on, and then day two, it was a rout. And um, the figures there, of course, were not just Grant, but it's also Sherman and Lew Wallace um, involved. So you have, and again, the when you visit these the battlefields, I, uh, Spotsylvania is another great example, is actually walking the battlefields, taking a look where the artillery was, getting a sense of uh, the strategy was involved. And as the war went on, and I make a, you know, Rob, you and I have talked about this a lot. When, as the war went on, the men of the Union and the men of the Confederacy became professional soldiers. And the war became savage. And then when African Americans started literally being recruited into the armies of the Union, um, the war was fought with no quarter. And so 1864, the war turned as savage as it got. And, um, you know, I have a new book that'll be coming out next year, if all, if all things go right. And that's actually my Civil War book. And I have a lot of discussion of um, the Battle of the Crater, you know, Petersburg, which was um, a disaster for the Union and was also one of the first battles involving African-American troops in the Eastern Theater and the repercussions of that. So I can't recommend enough for people to go to the battlefields. And um, like I said, we're so lucky we have these amazing places within driving distance. Uh, Steve, I've heard you speak a couple so times, and uh, a point that you made about Antietam, we think about the battle, we think about the soldiers, but you have made a very effective point of how it affected the farmers, the neighbors around there. They took the, the fences to, to, to burn for firewood, so for years they, there, was no, there was no trees around to rebuild the fences, how all the crops were destroyed. You, you make a very, very effective, compelling point that it was not just the soldiers that were impacted, it was the folks around the battle that were equally impacted. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, the, I mean, this is a civil war. Fought in places, I mean, look how beautiful Shopsburg is. Um, look how beautiful, you know, Monocacy Junction is. And, and of course, the, the town of Gettysburg, it is astounding to realize what took place in these places. And, of course, this, again, I really appreciate you making that point, Bill, because we try and make it clear that all three places and others became hospitals right after the battle. And uh, literally, uh, Gettysburg became a city, essentially, for weeks after that because of the numbers of wounded and the, and the citizens that were involved and what they had done and the fact that the impact this would have, and as you beautifully point out, 
the impact wasn't just immediate it was it was lasting and that's why the the aspect of commemoration and one of the ones i focused on happened to have been antietam the tremendous controversy over the national cemetery at antietam uh, bill i presume you've been to the cemetery i have yes it's it's magnificent isn't it very much so yeah. um and i but I all national reckon, cemeteries i think are equally impressive the all i marked yeah um well i think i've mentioned this before that my wife and i have tracked down the graves of many of the men about whom i write and it's always so moving first of all to find the graves and inevitably the vast majority of the tombstones have just their name company and regiment in the union army and that's so powerful a message and then when you see them like in in Maine, um, so many of the town cemeteries have men and women who have served in other wars. And it's that link. I mean, my father-in-law, who was a decorated soldier in World War II, is buried in a town cemetery in Walton, Connecticut, and directly across from him was a young man who died in Iraq. And like my father-in-law, that young man was a Bronze Star awardee. That link of service, that link of sacrifice, that link of what it means to serve this country is so powerful. And again, you know, Rob, 9-11 always brings back that aspect of what it means to be an American, what, we, what this country is supposed to stand for. And again, I, I presume you agree when you when you go to these cemeteries and you see the passage of time and what, what continues to be the passage of time, it, it couldn't be more powerful. And, and Steve, I'd like to expand that as well. And you're exactly right. Uh, but it's uh, not only those cemeteries on U.S. soil. We have uh, Normandy. We have France. I yes. had the, I had the fortune of visiting one in northeast in northeast India a few years ago. Of uh, those folks that died flying over the hump, and it was meticulously maintained. And there was a lot of U.S funding support it. It's so we have these wonderful cemeteries that pay homage and respect to the folks that have fallen, not only in the U.S., but throughout the world. Absolutely. I mean, we had that experience when we uh, visited some of the cemeteries in Canada. And, um, you know, the Canadians do a marvelous job of honoring their dead. And certainly in Europe, uh, Australia, you know, the Anzac um, when we were, when we were in both New Zealand and Australia, we went to a couple of places. And what's what has been so terrific the last decade, I would say, is the realization of particularly the World War II veterans who are dying out literally by the day, and now of course the Korean War veterans. Many of the men who were still alive who fought in World War II in Korea. Are, na- are making tapes, they're being interviewed, to get their experiences on the record. And inevitably, when they're asked why they do that, and by the way, it's always, they look fantastic. You can't believe how old some of these people are. Mm-hmm. They look wonderful, the survivor phenomenon. Their motivation is generally the same. Not to talk about what they did necessarily, but to honor those who did not return to honor those who are no longer able to tell us what they did and to make sure that people remember what they did. And that, I think, has been a wonderful thing that we've had, uh, very similar to the Shoah Foundation um, in terms of Holocaust survivors. All these things are an aspect of why commemoration is so important. Steve, if I can build upon that just a little bit, I had the great privilege a few years or so ago of uh, participating in the inauguration, uh, presidential inauguration. They have a uh, Medal of Honor winner breakfast, and it was an opportunity of a lifetime, something I always cherish. But I was struck about the these individuals that are the bravest of the brave that did so much they would never talk about themselves. They would always talk about the comrades, they'd talk about the other guys around the table, but never invoke their own stories. Well, that's the famous 
thing that Dick Winter says in the last episode of Band of Brothers. Do you remember what he said? Where his uh, he was quoting somebody else, but it's been attributed to Dick Winters. And someone's grandson asked a World War II veteran, I think one of the Easy Company veterans, were you a hero? And he said, no, but I served in a company of them. Yeah. And that always moves me. When, you've, when you're the real deal, when, you're, when you've been in, in combat, when you've been to war and survived and served with honor and with bravery, even though you were terrified, you have nothing to prove to anyone for the rest of your life. And this is why I so emphasize the warrior identity. I so emphasize that contrary to what is often portrayed about veterans, that the vast majority of American veterans do very well in civilian life. They utilize their experience. They utilize what they've learned. And we have the data to show that. And it's exactly what you're talking about. And as a matter of fact, if I meet someone who says they're a veteran and they start to brag about themselves, I am always extremely skeptical as to whether or not they actually have been a veteran or have, or have served at all. Because in my experience, I have never heard any veteran of war ever refer to his or herself as a hero, ever. Which so, is why I don't use the word, by the way. I so, only use the word hero in quotes. So Steve, just a real quick commentary on that. Um, many, many years ago now, um, when I was the editor of the local newspaper, we started a feature called Unsung Heroes. And it ran on Mondays between Memorial Day and Veterans Day. And we would pick um, usually people who were um, suggested to us in the community. And I can tell you back then, uh, it was a lot of World War II vets. And of course it's changed. And I've actually been gone for 15 years from the newspaper, but that um, that piece still continues, so I'm really happy about that. When we tried to get it started, I actually interviewed my father, who was yeah. a World War II staff sergeant in the U.S. Army, and he was like, oh, Maria, I don't want to talk to you about that. I, no. Um, you know, I came back, I restarted my life, I, um, I did what I needed to do, I served my country, and I said, Dad, you need to sort of be the little guinea pig to start this feature for me. And um, yeah, it was, it was very, um, some of the stories that would come out of that are just absolutely amazing. And people, for the most part, like you said, so humble, don't want to tell their stories. But once you start um, encouraging them, it's amazing what you learn. Uh, that, that's, that's a wonderful thing to hear. I, I can tell you a famous example of that. Uh, the great actor Charles Durning. For decades, people didn't know that Charles Durning landed at Normandy, survived the Malony Massacre, was a Silver Star and Bronze Star awardee, and he hadn't talked about the war. And then when PBS had an anniversary special on D-Day, this was after Saving Private Ryan came out. And Durning agreed to do that. And that's when he first started talking about his, his experience. And it was so powerful. You know, this great actor who, by the way, went to, went to um, acting school on the GI Bill. And then people looked at him and then saw something so different because what he had done as a young man. And again, among the bravest of the brave, as Bill was saying, you didn't hear Charles Durney talk about himself. He talked about the other men who landed there, who didn't get off the beach. And, and what it took, just like my father-in-law who landed at Utah Beach. And, you know, these, the, the way you honored your father and other deserving members of the service, it's the same way when you drive through Sharpsburg, and you see the beautiful banners that they have going through. Steve, I've got about uh, I've got about thirty seconds left, yeah. if you don't mind. Uh, where will you be this evening, and how do folks uh, get there or find out more about watching? Uh, well, 
well, it's actually uh, more of a private thing. Um, if you're going to be in Kenosha, Wisconsin on Saturday... <laughs> I will not. <laughs> I'm actually speaking, I'm doing my, my first talk on the Navy. I've never spoken on the Navy, which may, well, should probably go up, I'm hoping, on my website. And I'll keep you posted on other things, but people can always go to stephenagoldmanmd.com and see where I'm going to be appearing. And also, I try as much as I can to have the things posted for folks. Look forward to catching up with you again, Steve. Thanks so much. This has been a pleasure uh, to talk to all three of you. Thank Thanks, you. Steve. Dr. Stephen A. Goldman, and we are back with the final 50 seconds to wrap up the show next.